continuing in this trip through the book of Judges. Today is one of those particularly gross and gory stories. I'm just going to give you a little disclaimer if you've, you know, I don't know, if you have a sensitive stomach or something, this may be a, a tough one. Although we already, you know, read in the book of Acts about how God struck down Herod and the worms ate him, so you're probably going to be okay. <laughs> Mark Twain said this, he said, Adam was but human. This explains it all. He did not want the apple for the apple's sake. He wanted it only because it was forbidden. The mistake was in not forbidding the serpent. Then he would have eaten the serpent. <laughs> Mark Twain had quite a way with words, and it's interesting. I think there's a lot of wisdom there. Now, some of you... Are, are moms and dads, and your kids might have grown up, but they're still your kids, right? So you go back and you remember when your kids were little. Were there times that they wanted something, not because they had any reason to like it or want it or need it, but because you said, no, they can't have it, and now, now they want it, right? A minute ago, they had no desire for it, but the moment you said you can't have that, now they want it, right? It's amazing how God... God gives the old, in the Old Testament, he gives the, his people the book of the law. And one of the things we understand, if we understand the law properly, is that the guidelines and commandments that God gave were for the people's good. In other words, for, for them to, to properly enjoy life to its fullest, it would involve having a right relationship with God, right? Have no other gods before me. Uh, revere him and him only. If they have that relationship right. And then the rest of the commandments are all about, well, you probably shouldn't kill each other. That's probably a good way to have a good, successful life with one another, right? Not murdering one another. That's helpful. Not stealing each other's stuff. Not coveting each other's things. In other words, all of those guidelines were laid down for their benefit, for their good. And what did they do? As soon as they could, anything but that. They wanted whatever it was God said, you can't do, you can't have. That's what we want. <laughs> and, and we'd like to look back and we'd like to say, well, those foolish Israelites, what a bunch of maroons. And then all we got to do is look in the mirror, right? How many times do we, we look at ourselves, as the, the very things that we know the Lord has said no to, and we say, Lord, I want that. <laughs> Today we're going to look at Abimelech. Abimelech is a very distasteful person, not a good man, and some would actually argue that he was not in fact a judge, although he is listed here in, those, uh, in that category. All of the judges had some sort of flaw, some sort of a, a defect, right? And you'll find that all the way through, all of the judges had some sort of a, 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 an issue about them, and Abimelech is, is certainly one that, that fits that category of having a flaw, but what he doesn't have is a heart after God. What he doesn't have is we have no record of him being appointed by God to lead the people of Israel at all. And we don't find him defeating an enemy of Israel. What we find is him bringing sin and wickedness to the people of Israel. And so... Uh, that's why many theologians would not consider him an actual judge of Israel. But he did rule for three years, and we're going to take a look at this, this story. All right. In this story that we're going to look at this morning, we're going to talk about the sins of the fathers, the sins of the people, and the sins of Abimelech. How about we get started? You ready? LaRue, you ready? All right, LaRue's ready. Got the thumbs up. We're headed off. Here we go. Judges 8, verses 29 through 35. Jerobel, the son of Joash, went and lived in his own house. Now Gideon had 70 sons. By the way, Jerobel and Gideon, it's the same person, in case you're wondering there. Now Gideon had 70 sons, that's not a typo, his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, and he called his name Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, at Ophrah of the Abizrites. 
As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal Berit their god. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. And they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jeroboam, that is Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done to Israel. Israelites did not wait but a moment to jump right back into the sin and degradation that was part of their regular practice. Now, for us to truly understand Abimelech's disastrous rule and disastrous life, we need to understand his family issues. And when I say family issues, recognize that we all have family issues, right? A, a few years ago, it, it kind of became popular. You heard the phrase dysfunctional family, right? Have you heard that, that phrase, dysfunctional families? Anyone? Yeah, a couple of you are awake. That's great. All right. Well, where did you hear that phrase, dysfunctional family? Anyone? Television. That's good. Where? Probably Oprah or Dr. Phil, right? One of those, I imagine. Dysfunctional family. I always crack up dysfunctional family. I've never met a functional family. We're all dysfunctional at some level, aren't we? In fact, some of you have been married a long time. What do you discover over the years? You discover all your dysfunctions over the years. You discover what all of them are. You explore them all, don't you? It was all cute when you were, you know, young and in love. Ooh, and then you get married, and then you find out just how dysfunctional both of you really are. Right? Ain't nobody arguing yet. Okay? Yeah. Well, dysfunctional, well, Abimelech came from a dysfunctional family. His dad had 70 sons with a whole mess of wives. And we know he had more than one wife because he had that many kids. There's got to be more than one. Abimelech is the son of Gideon. Now, Gideon was the judge who delivered the people of Israel from the Midianites. We looked at him last week. Gideon was a, a timid, kind of fearful young man that God, out of his weakness, made him strong and used him to be a, a, a leader of Israel, delivered him from the Midianites, he was a godly man, but he was a flawed man, wasn't he? And in the verses we just read, we find some of his flaws. Many wives and at least one concubine who is the mother of Abimelech. Now, many times when an outside observer, maybe who doesn't know the Bible and, and is not a Christian, and they, and they hear something in Scripture that says that this guy had all these wives, and they say, see, your religion teaches polyg polygamy. Uh, no, it does not. It records the fact that Gideon was a knucklehead and had this many wives, but it doesn't say that God said, hey, Gideon, you should marry all these women. Nowhere does it say that. And nowhere will you find Scripture promoting or encouraging more than one wife. Because again, God knows what's best for us. Some of us have a hard time enduring the one wife we have. God loves us. He wouldn't give us another. I can say that. Dean is not in the room. No, the Bible never promotes it. In fact, every time you read an account of polygamy in Scripture, keep reading. And, uh, and in the next verses, what you will discover is the tragedy that followed. Let me give you an example. Maybe you've heard of this guy. 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. By the way, you remember those are all places they were supposed to get rid of those people and not intermarry them? Remember that? From the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither th th shall they with you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. It never says 
way to go, Solomon, but rather that the, this act of wickedness on his part turned away his heart from the Lord. Because of Gideon's sin in this area, just like Solomon, we have Abimelech. Abimelech is the, the byproduct of Gideon's sinful behavior in this area. And so when Abimelech looked at his father's life, he saw compromise in the area of following God's commands. Did he see his father as a leader that God used? Yes. Did he see his, his father as, as a man that, that grew in his faith? Yes. Well, what else did he see? A man that looked at the commands of God and looked at some of them and said, eh, I'm not going to follow those. How sad. Because Gideon was used by God. He's listed in the, the famous you know, faith chapter in Hebrews 11. And yet he failed in modeling a godly life for his son. Whatever he taught Gideon, excuse me, whatever Gideon taught Abimelech about God, he modeled for him disobedience. He modeled for him that yeah, you don't have to follow God in every area. That, you, know, you, can, you can just ignore God's commands in, an, in, a, in a different area. The same tragedy happens today all the time. We, we, we can have people who maybe they believe the right things, they understand theology correctly, they might even know the Bible, they can bring their kids to Sunday school, but if you're, if you're a person who follows God in some areas, but in another area you just say, well, Lord, I'm just not doing that, I'm just not going not gonna to follow your command there. Maybe it's something like, I'm not going to forgive that person, or I'm just going to continue to gossip, or I'm going to continue. There's an area in my life I'm just going to do whatever I want, and I'm going to ignore the commands of God. No matter all those other good things you think you're doing for the Lord, what you're telling your children and anybody else watching you is, obedience to God's really not that important. I can compromise anywhere I want. That's tragic. That happens. And I do think that there is, I just saw in the news this morning, they were talking about how Christianity, statistically, uh, the numbers are dropping in this, in this country. We're, uh, we're fast approaching becoming the minority religion in this country. And uh, you say, how, that, how does that happen? I, I think one of the ways that happens is if you have people that claim to be Christians and yet have areas in their life where they say, yeah, Lord, I'll be, I'll be following you in this area and that area, but ah, this area, ah, not doing it. That has an effect because your kids watch. Your kids watch and your neighbors watch and everybody watches. The sins of the fathers can do great damage to the lives of the children. We need to be people who recognize that God's command for purity affects all aspects of our lives. He's not looking for partial obedience. He's looking for complete obedience. Partial obedience is actually, in fact, disobedience. Secondly, in this story, we see the sins of the people. Now, this story is about ready to take an ugly turn. So go ahead and take a look with me, if you would. Judges chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Now, Abimelech, the son of Jerobel, went to Shechem to his mother's relatives and said to them and to the whole clan of his mother's family, Say in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem, which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Jeroboam rule over you, or that one rule over you? Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's relatives spoke all these words on his behalf in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem. And their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. And they gave him 70 pieces of silver out of the house of baal Berit, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. And he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the sons of Jeroboam, 70 men on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, for he hid himself. And all the leaders of Shechem came together, and all Beth Malo, and they went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar at Shechem. This is a really horrible story, isn't it? The people of Shechem decide that since Abimelech is family, they might as well have them be their leader. There's no decision to make sure that Abimelech would be a godly leader. Again, one of the things we don't find in this text about Abimelech is that God in any way ordained his being leader of anything. 
In fact, it's rather obvious that God is not consulted in this process at all. And Abimelech wants to make sure that he doesn't have any competition for this job, so he kills 70 brothers. Yikes. You, you think at some point right after that, the people of, of Shechem might say, yeah, I know he's family, but if he just slaughtered 70 of family members, maybe we don't want to necessarily put him in charge. Think that thought might have crossed their mind? I'd like to think it would have crossed mine. You just slaughtered 70 of us. Who's next? What is the sin of the people? Well, for one thing, they did nothing about the fact that their newly appointed leader just slaughtered 70 of his family members. That's kind of a problem. It isn't that as if they didn't have the books of the law. It isn't as if they didn't know God's commands. In fact, they certainly did. They were recipients of the law of Moses. They would have known enough to know that slaughtering your family is kind of a no-no. It's interesting. One of the, the things that was always a temptation for the people of Israel was that they wanted to be like the nations around. They wanted to have a king. Now, it's interesting. It does not really say in the text that that uh, Abimelech was a judge, but it does say that they made him king in verse 6 here. Why? Because they wanted to be like everybody else that had kings. And so they, they, they were intent on being like everybody else. They were willing to bypass any kind of moral standard so that they could have a ruler like the peoples around them. Abimelech was Gideon's son, and so they figured, well, you know, other nations around us, the king's son sometimes becomes king. We want to be like them. He slaughtered his family members. Well, but other pagan nations around us, they do that. We'll just ignore God's commands about not murdering. Again, this is why many scholars don't view Abimelech as truly one of the judges of Israel. God did not raise him up to lead. The people put him in charge. And in fact, he's the one that promoted himself for the job. He does not bring victory against an evil oppressor. Rather, he kills his own family. And he does not bring the people of Israel to the worship of God, but rather he continues in wickedness. Notice here as well, it's Abimelech that brought himself up to the people. Abimelech wants to be in charge. Abimelech wants power. Morals were not important, just power. I'm always leery of people who want to have some kind of title or position or power. And they're motivated by being in charge. You should be leery of those people as well. It's interesting to note that the kind of leadership that God desires from those who would serve in his kingdom is always very different from the way the world looks at leadership. Jesus had this to say. He tells us here in Luke 22, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. So, the way up is down. The way, the way to greatness is service. You're looking for someone who's qualified to lead others? Look for someone who's willing to serve and not be noticed. If you want to be great, learn to be a servant. This is something that Abimelech never learned. And for that reason, we don't find him being God's appointed leader. Be very careful who you put in charge of things. In the Apostle Paul's letters to both Titus and Timothy, where we find qualifications for deacons and elders, do you know what it primarily talks about in qualifications? Moral integrity. It's not talking about the, the smartest and the one with the most skills. And all. No. It talks about the one who is morally qualified, spiritually qualified, has integrity. Moral qualifications. Those who lead in your church should be godly. They should be known as people of integrity. And anytime we compromise on making sure that our leaders are spiritually qualified, we will pay the price. 
just from my involvement with various churches and knowing other pastors, I could tell you story after story after story. Well, we made them an elder because we needed elders and they wanted to be one, and so we did. And then the tragedy that happens because they weren't qualified, they should have never been in that position. They were not morally qualified people. Now, a bad deacon is not likely to slaughter 70 of his family members. I'm not, I'm not saying that he would necessarily. However, he might promote false doctrine. He might not stand and, and insist on the Bible being the authority in, in, in the church. He might look the other way when gossip is going on and undermining the church. The people of Shechem sin greatly by what they allowed to lead them. And there is always that admonition for every church in every place at all times. Be careful who you put in charge. Sometimes there are those who look like, wow, they'd be a great leader. They're charismatic. They really want to lead. They, they're, they're successful in the business world. That, are they morally qualified? That's so much more important. The sins of the people was who they allowed to be in charge. We need to be careful of that as well. Finally, we get to the sins of Abimelech and we come to his gruesome end. Are you ready? Judges chapter 9, verses 50 through 57. Then Abimelech went to Thebes and encamped, encamped against Thebes and captured it. But there was a strong tower within the city, and all the men and women and all the leaders of the city fled to it and shut themselves in, and they went up to the roof of the tower. And Abimelech came to the tower and fought against it and drew near to the door of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, lest they say of me a woman killed him. And his young man thrust him through, and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, everyone departed to his home. Thus God returned the evil of Abimelech, which he committed against his father in killing his 70 brothers. And God also made all the evil of the men of Shechem return on their heads. And upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. Now, I find it interesting as you read the text. He doesn't want anyone to know that a woman killed him. And yet here it is in the text that we're reading to, no, 3,000 some years later, we're reading that a woman killed him. So I think his plan kind of failed just a little bit. In fact, it's kind of ironic. Think of the fact that this story is in Scripture. This story has been read from pulpit to pulpit, century to century, for all these years. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people know that he was killed by a woman. So way to go, buddy. Now, in most of the stories we find in the book of Judges, it's an enemy of Israel that's brought to judgment by God, right? But in this story, who's brought to judgment? Abimelech is. This self-promoted leader of the people of Israel is brought to judgment. Verse 56 says that God returned the evil of Abimelech, which he committed against Gideon, his father. In this closing scene, Abimelech is going to... All these people go to this tower to be safe. They go, they go up to the top of it, lock themselves in, so Abimelech is going to set the tower on fire and burn them all. That's such a horrid thought. And this awesome woman <laughs> drops a millstone on his skull and, and uh, he has to ask his armor bearer to run him through. What a tragic ending, a tragic story. By the way, we, we have this woman here dropping a millstone on the guy's head. And then a few weeks ago, we had, remember we had jail? And she took a, yeah, you're nodding your head because nobody forgot that story, right? Tent peg and a, and a hammer and, and right through the skull into the ground. So the scripture made sure to let you know went through both sides of the skull. Maybe, maybe she went right in the ear. It was, it was hollow all the way through. I don't know. Um, but I would just say, already with those two stories, I say women two, men zero, right? 
These are, these are women you do not want to mess with. You know, there are times we look at life and we say, and maybe you've been there. Have you ever, have you ever looked at the situation around you say, is there ever going to be any justice? You look at people and it seems like they get away with everything, right? There are people out there who have robbed banks and they've, they've taken millions. I swear to you, if I took a pencil, they'd lock me up. And we sometimes look and we, we look at people's lives and we say, there's no justice. We can get real discouraged. Well, Abimelech got some justice here, didn't he? I'm sure there were times people thought, well, he's just getting away with it. He, he slaughtered the 70 brothers and nothing happened. They made, him, they made him king for crying out loud. Well, he got his. And friend, I want you to be encouraged. God isn't asleep at the wheel. Isaiah 13, 11, God says this, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. There's one who's keeping score better than you. And he says, I will punish the world for its evil. The day's coming, so fret not. We, we don't need to waste our time worrying, getting all anxious and angry and upset over whether or not someone's going to get their justice. Everyone will. And that leads us to understanding our own situation. Because the reality is, we do like to look at others and say, when are they going to get their justice? But we don't tend to look at ourselves and say, when am I going to get mine? <laughs> right? Is it my breath that did that? Um, the reality is this, is if God were to judge us as our sins deserve, we're all kind of in big trouble, aren't we? <laughs> so when we start thinking about justice, we need to understand two things. One, God keeps, keeps the tally. God will settle the score. God will bring justice to every person. And two, this is where we as believers in Jesus Christ get to celebrate the amazing grace of God, right? Because he does not treat us as our sins deserve, but rather because we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, God says, okay, you deserve my wrath, but because you've placed your faith in my son, I'm putting the punishment on his back at the cross. That's the whole message of the gospel right there, isn't it? And so when we think about justice, remember that God will... He'll take care of the evil, including the evil of yours. If you've placed your faith in Christ, you don't have to pay for it. What an encourage, what an invitation to make sure that we've placed our faith in Christ, repented of our sins, and come to him in faith. And another opportunity for us to celebrate his amazing grace. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement that we find in it. We pray, Lord, that you would help us. Help us, Lord, to be careful that we don't pass on sins, our sins to our children, that we don't model for them that we can live a, a life of compromise. Lord, the sins of the fathers are deadly to the children. Help us to realize that you require holiness in all aspects of our lives. And Lord, help us as we consider that the sins of the people in this story amounted to who they put in charge. Lord, help us to be careful that we put in leadership people who are qualified, moral, biblical, godly people. And Lord, we thank you that you will bring justice. And Lord, that's an occasion for us to rejoice in the grace that you have poured out on us. And we thank you, Lord, that because of Christ, you remain just, but we go unpunished because you took the punishment for us. Today, we celebrate that amazing grace in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing?